Sometimes it's important to stop and just take a pause and remember why we're here and how all of this started and, and where we're going. So many of you have been uh, here year after year, um, and it reminded us that um, we, we really have become um, extraordinarily successful. So how did that happen in this town? Well, we were inspired by Maria Shriver when she was first lady and her women's conferences, which many of you have been to. And when that, you know, the largest gathering of women in the world ended, we thought, how can we scale down um, and do something in, in Sacramento that embodied the same values and principles? So we started She Shares, Donna Lucas and Tina Thomas and I and many of you, um, with the purpose of recognizing women who were on the front lines of society and giving them a place to come where we could learn from them and be inspired by them. Whether they come from sports or entertainment, politics, government, the nonprofit world or art and philanthropy, we wanted to give them a personal place where they could leave their offices behind and join us and talk from their hearts and from their minds about what made them successful, what gives them passion and what gives them purpose so that we could leave here after an hour lunch and go back and be better people for it. And I hope we're achieving that. And I'd like to say, you know, one way that I think we are is if you look at our growth. We have a mentorship program now that has hundreds of alumni. Uh, a shout out to Karen Baker, the state's chief um, volunteer officer for leading a mentorship workshop just this Monday. Um, we have steady sponsors, we have killer speakers, and if you look at who is represented just in this sellout room today, it'll blow your mind. I mean, we represent, look at just this board, this, this listing of who you are. That says a lot about who we've become. So I thank you all, and we thank you all for being a part of this. So today's program, in many ways, um, embodies uh, in, it, more than any other program that we've had. And we've had four programs a year for eight years. This program, to me, is extremely special. Not only are our women uh, speakers today on the front lines, but they're creating the front lines. They are creating the future. Policy, politics, budgets. Um, every, just moments ago, the EITC expansion was passed by the legislature. I mean, it kind of makes me nervous that they're all here. Like, who's running the shop? Yeah. <laughs> they have a strong bench, I'm, I'm, uh, no doubt. So let me just very briefly um, say who we have here today. Um, Catherine Lehman is the Legal Affairs Secretary that, to uh, Governor Newsom. Catherine is a national leader on civil rights, period. She was nominated by President Obama to sit on the Commission for Civil Rights, a position she still holds. She has been recognized by and awarded um, by some of the most prestigious legal um, journals in the country for many, many years. She's won awards from Politico Magazine as one of the 50 Thinkers Transforming Politics, awards by Yale Law School, Chronicle of Higher Education, the California Lo Lawyer. I could go on and on. I, I think that we're so lucky to have Catherine Lehman in California and here today. Ana Montesantos, her name rings in the halls of government for many generations now. I hate to say, the most reluctant person to be here today, and in many ways, the, um, the, 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 the deepest, uh, has left the deepest imprint on some of the most important policies our state has had to deal with, including budget reform uh, for Governor Brown to take us out of a deep uh, deficit into a very robust and positive budget, including the implementation of the American uh, of the ACA. 
She has been involved in economic equity issues uh, from their core to their success in California. And I know that she is um, reluctant to be here, but she is so revered and we're so lucky to have this extremely capable problem solver in, in the room. And finally, the Chief of Staff to Governor Gavin Newsom, Ann O'Leary, who is a woman uh, on the front lines of being a lawyer, a social policy architect, a nonprofit leader, a mentor, and a mom. She comes to her job with a unique combination of policy chops and political grit that only the daughter of a labor leader, uh, a former staffer at the White House, and one of the closest advisors to a United States Senator, and should be President of the United States, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> the one thing I will say about Anne O'Leary, having known her now for almost 30 years, somewhere like that, getting close in the late 20 years or something, is that she's not only incredibly capable in the ways that I've said, but she is such a good person. She has her staff's back, she has her friends back, and she's leading from a place of principle and values that I think is um, extraordinary, unusual, and we're really lucky to have it. So with that, I want to turn it over to Donna to introduce the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth and most extraordinary person here, our moderator, Monica Lozano. Yeah, come on. Why don't you guys come on up? Talking about these women could take the whole full hour, um, but I am delighted and honored to introduce Monica Lozano, who is not only an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, a strategist, a brilliant, a warrior, but is also a friend. Um, many of you know Monica because she was the editor and publisher of La Opinion. Uh, she is the third generation of, of running La Opinion, a 90-year-old newspaper that her grandfather started in 1926, and she took it over and took it to be an American institution. So she's an amazing businesswoman, entrepreneur. She has served as the chair of the State Board of Education, the chair of the Board of Regents, she serves on several nonprofit and corporate boards, or has done that. And today, it's actually my honor I get to work with her because she is uh, the CEO and president of the College Futures Foundation, which is a foundation dedicated to uh, gaining access and completion for underserved communities for students to go to school, to go to higher education. So it's a very great organization, and I'm very lucky that I get to work with her on that. So Monica, thank you for doing this for us today. And this is going to be a great conversation. Yes. Thank you, Donna and Karen, for this extraordinary event. She Shares, I was mentioning to somebody that I haven't had the opportunity to come to She Shares before, so I watched like nine episodes on YouTube <laughs> last night. Um, and it's extraordinary. It's fun, it's casual, it's conversational. You've got, you know, not just purpose-driven people that are um, our guests today, but bring passion and have had extraordinary careers. So today we get a chance to hear from these remarkable leaders. We will open it up for questions from the audience um, after about 40 minutes of conversation up here, so get your questions ready. Um, we're going to talk about everything from the personal to the professional. Thank you for doing this, Anna. We understand that <laughs> Anna doesn't typically Sorry. like doing a lot of um, public speaking, so she's here and um, rounding out this, this wonderful <laughs> panel. As I was watching um, the photographs that we're scrolling through, um, just to reiterate what Karen and Donna mentioned about these women, they have advised presidents, vice presidents, candidates for presidents, um, you United States senators, governors, um, and are now really in so many ways um, leaders in this administration here in Sacramento. But when you think back over your careers, um, was there a moment in time when you knew that public service um, was your calling? And if you could just describe, was there something that led you to acknowledge 
that you would commit yourself as individuals to this kind of public service that you've done. And, and why don't we start with you, and then we'll just open it up for. Yeah, so I probably am maybe of the rare person who never, ne never knew that there was something other than public service to do. <laughs> so I grew up in a household where my dad was a labor leader and my mom was a social worker. Uh, my, my sister, frankly, struggled with undiagnosed mental health, and so there was a lot of advocacy around that in the household. And so I just, it was just in my being, and I literally never thought of doing anything other than being uh, kind of an advocate and uh, having a voice. I think it took me some time to kind of claim that voice and figure out how to do it, uh, but I think it was in my core being. Mm -hmm. Anna, is it similar? Or? I, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was probably 1989 and the aftermath of Hurricane Hugo in Puerto Rico, and uh, where I was living and where the power at that point in time was out for what felt like a long time, but pales in comparison to the experience of the aftermath of, um, of the two right. most recent mm -hmm. hurricanes. And so what happened? So the uh, aftermath of the hurricane? In the aftermath of the hurricane, uh, um, government was overwhelmed. Uh, I, anyway, I was a kid, and I started with, we got power a little sooner than other folks did. So we started at the school. Everyone who had power, we would get ice and bring it to people who didn't have power so they could keep their insulin cold. And it was one of those things that was a a reminder of the importance of doing what we can, and we're kind of all in this together. And uh, anyway, I guess emergencies is one of the ways in which we break through that. And right. in reflecting on it, I think in some ways that was what cemented that mm -hmm. I care about things that are about a bigger purpose. Mm -hmm. wow. Catherine? I think I didn't have a, a particular moment that was an epiphany. I think like Anne, it was, it was more in my DNA. My uh, parents were civil rights activists. They sang me freedom songs as my lullabies as a child. And, uh, <laughs> that my, my mother was, my mother's black. She grew up in Richmond, Virginia before and after Brown versus Board of Education was decided. And so I heard her stories about uh, how her specific educational experience did not change, but how the promise from the highest court in the land that the condition of her life was unconstitutional and uh, should be changed. That, that was a promise that animated everything thereafter for her. Uh, she still couldn't try on a hat in a department store. She still drank from colored water fountains. She rode the back of the bus. But she raised her two children to believe that we could be anybody we wanted to be. And it was amazing to grow up with that kind of promise and that expectation. And I wanted to make it real. So this is why I do what I do. Great. So um, one of the things that I just heard, um, the circumstances, Ana, that you described in Puerto Rico, and I'm assuming you were there with your family, but your parents as labor leaders, your, your parents, Catherine, as civil rights activists, um, inculcating that spirit of um, wanting to contribute. Would you say that your parents were the most important role models for you? Are there others in your lives that you point to that served as important role models that helped develop your, not just your spirit, but your approach to life? Well, I, I feel like I've been extraordinarily lucky in my life to both have mentors, including people like Hillary Clinton, and you know, you just dream of having a mentor like that in your life, but she's been just an incredible friend and mentor to me for many years. But I also have to say that I find a lot of mentorship and support from my peers, and I moved to California about 16 years ago. I don't have family here. Um, I have two children, uh, so I do have now family here. Um, but I, um, but I have made, um, I've really received professional and personal mentorship and support, including people in this room. Uh, you know, Karen Skelton is here, who is, as she said, just like a long dear friend. Kate Gordon is here. Aaron Sir is here. There's people in this room who have become like family because we've worked so closely together. And I think part of what I would say um, is that just really making sure you find mentorship. Where you, where you see it, and it often can be your peers. And I, I will say, you know, I'll just give a story of uh, Karen who, you know, we were working on Maria, we worked on the Maria Shriver report, and I was having a hard time in my personal life, and she was trying to call me, and I was like, ignoring her, frankly. <laughs> I was like, um, I gotta deal with something else. And so she, I, um, <laughs> she drove down from Sacramento, to, I was living in Berkeley at the time, and she drove down without telling me she was coming, and literally, I'm gonna start crying, literally knocked at my door. I was like, are you okay? Because you're not responding. And I was just like, that's not like you. And, um, and then, you know, she just has been incredibly supportive in this job. 
And so I just feel really lucky to have that type of mentorship and support from my peers, oftentimes women, who really say, like, you can do this, and we're going to hold you, and we're going to make sure you got this, and that's been a big difference to me. That's really wonderful. Anybody else share a story about mentorship? And I mean, I think I just, uh, so much of what Anne said, I just completely uh, agree with and have also been just incredibly lucky to be the, to be the you know, benefit from people who've just helped me along the way and helped me figure out how to do things, you know, and, uh, and be a better person and challenge me. And uh, it's, you know, people, I mean, it's, you know, poor Diane Cummins has had breakfast with me every week since 2004. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's, it's, been, it's been really lucky and fun. And when I, I came here as a fellow, and I was talking to one of my, and, and I was talking to one of my um, college friends, and I was telling him some random stories about whatever the heck happened, and it, and he comes back to me, he's like, "Do any men work there in positions of power?" <laughs> uh, and uh, it was, you know, it was fun because I sort of realized, like at that point in time, it was like, you know, Diane Cummins was. Uh, uh, Sarah Burton's uh, chief uh, budget director, Leslie Cummings, was uh, running the healthcare stuff for the speaker's office. Diane Griffiths was the speaker's chief of staff. And it's like, it's the, the privilege of working in an environment with, um, with lots of other women who helped me figure this out and who continue to do that today. It's just been awesome. And I, I too have been really lucky to have amazing mentors. And I, I uh, just want to reflect on the reality that those mentors have both been people who have come well before me and people who are coming well after me. So uh, in, in law school, as an example, I was lucky to be taught constitutional law by Burke Marshall, who wrote the 1964 Civil Rights Act and was Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights under President Kennedy and is an amazing mentor. And when I've done federal civil rights enforcement work, I carry his lessons with me every day, and uh, I miss him every day. Uh, but in addition, in my life as a litigator, I have represented amazing clients who are sometimes kids and who are amazing in their mentorship up for what they want from a lawyer, from what they want from advocacy, from what they want from government, and from their world around them. And their, their life lessons I also carry with me every day. And just to give one example, I, I represented a class of kids at an elementary school in Los Angeles that didn't have walls or sound barriers or visual barriers in their classes. There were five classes meeting at the same time in an auditorium. And had there been a fire, those kids would not have gotten out. There was only one door. Uh, they couldn't hear their teachers during silent reading because another class was uh, still talking. It was just a really unconscionable condition for the kids to be learning in. And their families had been advocating with the school for two years. And they hadn't been able to get relief. So we sued. And 10 days later, we got relief. So the, you know, the end result is really wonderful. But the reason that we got that terrific relief was not my stellar lawyering, but my amazing 10-year-old clients who stood up at a press conference and said, sometimes you have a new backpack, and you love your new backpack. And in my school, there's no place to put that backpack. I mean, it was just so pithy and so perfect. And uh, hearing that, that distillation of the rights that they had and what they knew they needed and why they wanted more justice for them. I carry a picture of, of that kid with me still, and, and I uh, appreciate her lessons in the work that I do now. Well, very powerful. There are so many things that you all just said that I want to come back to. But let me start with this idea of um, women in the workplace and the kind of environment in which you've created. And all of you bring your values, you bring your spirit. But this dynamic here is representative of what's happening in the administration. And another point that you just made, you know, are there any men that work there? Tell us about the dynamic. I know there, there are. are. There are. I know there are. Some men are here. The governor. Um, ben. The, the, the governor. Ben. 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 Here's ben. ben is here. And um, what are you trying to I actually would really like to get a sense of how you're organizing yourself. And, and when you think about bringing in extraordinary people, you're looking for certain qualities, and then you're also creating a team and a sense of camaraderie yeah. and, and commitment to the vision of this governor. But talk a little bit about what that dynamic is like and how you think about um, orchestrating an office like um, the office of the governor, the horseshoe. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to do was to create an office that really did represent California mm -hmm. and was uh, represent California in all the ways. And I, I'm really proud that we have the most diver diverse horseshoe in the history of the state of California, and that's really meaningful to me. Thank you. Um, um, 
Um, one of the one of the things that you know you can get the best and the brightest. Uh, you have to you have to work at it because you have to convince them. No offense, but you have to convince them to move to Sacramento or, or come from a different job, and, you, and to get paid oftentimes much less than they were getting paid before. Um, but you can get people to come here. I think the question is, how do you actually get a team that can work together? and that understands the values of what we're trying to do. And so one of the things that I just have been incredibly humbled by is I don't really you know, care about diversity in terms of checking boxes. I care about what you're bringing to the table in terms of your life experiences and your stories and what that means of how you actually then become a leader in your office and the public policy work that you do. And so that's been really important to me. But it's also been one of my, um, one of a former colleague of mine, some of you might know a guy named Matt James, who I worked with a number of years ago, um, once told me that he had a policy that he didn't hi he only hired nice people, he didn't hire jerks. And I was like, of course. But As then I was like, well, actually, that not everybody has that theory. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to try to adopt that. And I feel like I've succeeded. Boy, you know. Um, so, but it, but it really does matter. And not everybody agrees with it either. So what, it was interesting. I was telling somebody, actually, um, after the Hillary Clinton team, I was like, you know, we all really got along. It was a really nice team, and we really liked each other. And someone was like, "Well, that's why you lost." Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay, that is um, not why you lost. <laughs> I was like, uh, "Well, I don't, I don't know if that's why we lost." Um, there's a lot of reasons, but I will say that there is this, some people don't agree. They feel like you should be fighting in the office, and it, it's not that we don't disagree. The three of us, we we actually joke about it because we can have very strong disagreements among the three of us. But we respect each other, and we come at it with kindness, and it's not a personal attack. It's like, I have a different opinion about what's going to happen with this outcome or a different idea. Um, but it really is a come to the table with respect, come to the table with the whole person that you are. So that's the type of team that we've tried to create, and I think um, it's you know something that I feel proud about. Catherine. The, thank you. You, we were just talking, you've moved from across country to join this administration. You have had an extraordinary career. What was it about this opportunity that motivated you to make this move and join this administration at this moment in time? So coming home to California was very appealing to me. Right. Uh, and it's nice to be back. Uh, also, uh, I really craved the chance to make the kind of difference that we can make together here. This governor is amazing. And he seemed amazing from afar. He is, in fact, amazing up close. And the, the idea of being able to work in an administration that is as committed to a progressive vision for social justice and for governance was uh, an opportunity that, that I couldn't have passed up had it not been in the great state of California, but it's nice that it, that it was. And, and at the time, Anna and Anne were the only two staff announced that, uh, that I knew the governor was going to have with him. And Anna is, in fact, legendary. I'm just going to make it more unpleasant for you to be here. But <laughs> But I had been hearing about Anna for decades, and so the, the thought of being able to work with that kind of mind and that kind of talent was unbelievably appealing to me. And I knew Anne, and I knew her extraordinary commitment, her extraordinary leadership. I'd never worked closely with her, and it's been an amazing, amazing gift to be able to do it. So that, that kind of opportunity, I thought, just wouldn't exist at any other time. An amazing governor, an amazing chance, and uh, the, the scope of difference that could be made if I came, uh, couldn't pass it up. And I saw you just look over at Anne. As you were saying, Catherine, she's an amazing leader, and you whispered to her, she is. Um, talk about your relationship with Anne. And I, would, I also would really like to hear, you've served under three governors. Um, what makes this distinctive? What's different about working in the Newsom administration versus the other two administrations? So I think that Karen absolutely like nailed it when she was talking about Anne. Whenever people, like ask me about her, it's just, you know, she's of course brilliant and, you know, strategic and all of these different things. And one thing that she is that's very important to me is she's also very calm. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but, but I think she's, but I think she's also incredibly kind. And, uh, and nice. it's, it's not only about the team that she, um, that she's put together, but it's about how she leads. And, uh, and how it's, it's in how she does the work. You know, whenever we're working on major things, Anne always creates a table that keeps us focused, that keeps us talking to each other, that has us resolve things in, you know, in, uh, in, in a respectful way. And it's just a complete and total privilege to work for her. 
Uh, so um, anyway, so what you know, what's uh, what is different? It's like there are similarities and there 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 are differences. I guess part it's it's you know it's like I feel like you're never a control experiment, right? So I can't like I'm a different person than I was in a different point in time. How much of it is different about me? How much is different about the the um, the situation? But I just want I think one of the things that is just our time I think makes it very different. I think the um, the you know the fact that I mean this governor um, is is you know showing the way during our time for how we can move forward together um, it's just a real gift um, and I think the environment that Ann has built in our office um, and the team she's built and the focus on the fact that we're all here for a bigger purpose and that this matters and that we you know public service has public in it for a reason mm -hmm. um, I think it's just it's it, it makes it really, really um, a complete and total privilege to be doing what I get to do every day. That's wonderful. Um, I was going to ask about leadership because you've all brought it up when you were talking about um, this dynamic and you've worked with and under um, very different types of individuals, um, leadership styles, leadership qualities, decision making styles. Are there Two or three things that you would say are the essence of effective leadership that you would want to highlight today? Well, I want to start with, you know, first of all, I, I'm incredibly appreciative of the governor who gave me this opportunity and I think is an extraordinary leader himself. Um, he, I didn't, one of the things I was sharing with some of the people on the team the other night is that, that one of the things that's been hardest about this job that I didn't anticipate being so hard is that I realized I really didn't know anybody. I didn't know the governor very well, and I, I knew Anna and Catherine a little bit, but it was really a little bit. Like, I was, their reputations precede them. They're amazing. They're superstars. It's, it, you know, incredible that I get to work with them. But I didn't have a personal relationship, really, with either of them that was, you know, very deep. And so, um, you know, I think that has been, um, been interesting. But one of the things I would say is that um, it's been a great privilege to see the governor really let us you know, kind of take hold and, and really support us. And I, he's done it in both subtle ways and, and powerful ways. So I'd say, you know, the subtle ways is just, you know, allowing us to develop this team that really is, you know, supporting us and saying, I want a diverse team, but then just really letting us build it with one another. So of course, I, you know, Anna and I started it. We were the first two that he hired. But then the, they all, you know, built the, this incredible teams underneath that is the, the structure that's our office. But the governor has also done things that are really important for women. And I just want to mention, because I think it's, it's, they're not things that should be unnoticed. Um, and, and I think that the, but they are behind the scenes. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples, which is he always really makes sure to, to put forward that we are his partners and that we are working with him. So one day, I was actually running late. Um, it, I was going to a briefing with him on top secret like security when you first come into the government about all the bad things that might happen. Um, and so, um, I, and we were supposed to start at nine, and it was north of Sacramento. And I had gone home to my children in Oakland the night before, and I was like, perfectly, I was like, oh, I'll drop them off from school, then I'll get, <laughs> get up there. It was supposed to start at 10. I'll get up there, just plenty, plenty of time. And I get this text when I'm like just outside of Oakland. The governor's running early. He'll be there half an hour early. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I start driving a little too fast to <laughs> up there. But I got up there and I walked into the room and I realized I was the only woman there. It, it was, you know, as they are in the military and the security world, it's a little male heavy sometimes. But the governor um, made this really big point. He was being briefed and he didn't see me come in at first. And he turned around and said, oh, and he stopped the entire meeting and said, this is Ann O'Leary. She's my chief of staff. And like made sure I had a seat right next to him and said, you really should be briefing both of us. You know, we're in this together kind of. And really just made the point of that this is the, the, my partner. And I would say he does that all the time and make sure, you know, whether it's when he's signing something, he wants us in the pictures. He's, you know, much to Anna's chagrin, he really is the brilliant <laughs> person often, but likes to be behind the scenes. Um, but I think that that matters to say, I see you, I value you, you're, you're not invisible to me, you're a partner, you're doing this work with me. And so that's been really meaningful um, to me. And I, I also will just say, um, and this isn't going to be the, you know, love show between all of us, but I just say, I am so incredibly grateful of these two. Uh, this has been hard. Like, I have these young kids in Oakland. I broke my leg strangely, and I had these, like, complications, and all these, like, crazy things happen. 
these two like showed up to make sure I was okay and like brought me food and were like, and it wasn't because they work for me and how to, they're just incredibly kind people. And so I think part of it is just that we've able in a very short period of time be able to create this like pretty close friendship and um, support system that's made a big difference. You know, I want to jump in just to say that, that I agree with all of that. And I, um, I also think that the core leadership that you bring uh, to the way that we do the work is amazing and it's totally consistent with the governors. So the two of you have a, a very compatible work leadership style. The, uh, I also have two children. My children have been in Maryland for these first six months. And so I've gone home every weekend to see them and then come back. And I've worked a week a month out of Maryland and Anne is an extraordinarily exacting boss, as she should be, because all of California rides on our decisions. And she also has not batted an eye uh, about making for that flexibility. So it's made for very late night calls, because it's three hours later in DC than it is here. Uh, you know, but, but I'm able to do it, and I'm also able to see the people I love the most in the world and to, to manage that flexibility. And you lead in that way for all of us in the office and, and the governors parenting is very important to him as a governor. And so the, the uh, reality that people have lives and we also need to be able to be on call 24 seven available to do the work because the work demands it. And you don't have to be in front of me to do that work has been a really important flexibility for me to make this transition work. And also, and uh, I think a metaphor for the way that you are an extraordinary leader for all of us because you and the governor expect us to be ready, on the ball, with an answer, well-informed every time, whenever, on, on the, the particular points that are, that are coming to us, which is invigorating and exciting and, and fun. And also, you don't care if it's on the phone. You don't, you don't care where we are when we're doing it. If I'm at the grocery store, we can get each other wherever we are you know, to, to, to get to the end result that we need to get to. And, it's that, and that environment is uh, terrific for me, and that flexibility has been amazing. So how, I, it sounds extraordinary, and what you've been able to create in such a short period of time is actually what allows you, I think, to be as effective as you've been on the policy side. So let's take um, these relationships, your vision, your commitment, I think you call it a progressive um, social agenda that the governor has, and convert it now into a discussion about policy. And one of the things, Anne, as I was preparing for today, um, there was a story that came out in the New York Times that talked a little bit about, you know, is it too much? Are we trying to get too much done in too short of time? And, no. Um, pardon me? <laughs> no, it is not too much. <laughs> okay. She's on the talking board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So talk about the, um, the policy priorities and how you think about managing um, to completion. You talked about the EITC. Right. That's extraordinary. Um, it will help women and families in ways that um, we know something like the earned income tax credit. So what are some of the other policy um, priorities and um, what you're shepherding through, not just as they represent, and you know, I, I have this you know, folks that I've worked with have understood this, that, you know, for me, budgets, Anna, budgets are a demonstration of values. It's an articulation of values and where you put your priorities. Um, so talk about the policy priorities as well as how they're showing up in this first budget um, right. that the governor put forward. Well, let me start by saying that the governor has an incredibly ambitious policy agenda. He ran on an agenda that was very robust. And I think when, when, when you ask him, he'll say, you know, people can't wait. So if somebody's having a problem because they can't pay their rent or they can't pay their prescription drugs or they have a disabled child or, you know, so on and so forth down the line, they, you can't say, oh, I'm sorry, today I'm working on climate change, so you just have to wait <laughs> six months. I'm sorry, you can't pay your rent. Um, and so part of it is that there's this really big issue of, like, we have to show up for people who demand leadership at this critical time. That said, it is my job and the job of the senior team to really figure out how do you actually try to channel that and organize it in a way that allows you to get things done. One organizing principle I'd like Anna to talk about it is really the budget. And so, and Anna's leadership, unfortunately, Keeley just left, but Keeley Bosler, who many of you know, is just an extraordinary leader too, head of our Department of Finance. The two of them have really shepherded us um, uh, through this. Um, and I think I'll let Anna speak to how they did that, and it really is extraordinary. One of the other things we try to do is we try to take these, you know, hundreds of campaign promises and think about how do you organize this. We were joking at one time, we're like, oh, great, you know, we got it down to 37 priorities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, that's hard to make happen. 
So what we try to do is to say, okay, well, how do you think about this thematically? And there's really three themes of our administration. One is all around affordability and opportunity. You know, we do live in this, uh, this era of just incredible cost crisis and pressure in California. And we also, many of us really, you know, got to be where we're sitting here today because of education and social mobility and the opportunity to participate. And so how do we make sure that we're, you know, supporting Cradle to Career, which Ben Cheetah is our senior advisor on Cradle to Career and has an amazing story himself um, in terms of uh, social mobility and education. And so we try to make sure we're doing both of those things on affordability and opportunity. The second thing we're trying to do is really this, this issue of justice for all. So you saw that, and Catherine was incredibly critical on this, where we um, you know, had the executive order on putting a moratorium on the death penalty. We also have been fighting for safe drinking water, clean drinking water for everybody in California. We've been fighting for respect of our immigrant community and not the vitriol that's coming out of Washington. And what does that really mean when you put it in? So, And then the third bucket is really around effective governing, because the fact of the matter is that if we can't like go home and turn the lights on and make sure that we have you know heat in our home, if our utilities don't work, if we have wildfires and we aren't able to serve our people, then you know who are we to be serving the government? Because the core functions of the government have to work, uh, and so we're really taking all of that seriously. Um, and that includes making sure that you're not just effectively governing in the moment, but you're doing it in the future. Kate Gordon's been leading our work on climate change. Um, and so really, you know, it's all of those three things trying to figure out. And then you have to do it through, um, through avenues like the budget. So I'd love Anna to say a little bit about that. So um, I, uh, I love budgets not because I love math, <laughs> but because I feel like they're, they're the, you know, they're kind of the, the process through which you figure out not only what are the priorities, but in what order do they come? And as a staff person, it's nice to know, like, you know, it's a thousand, but like, let's be clear on one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and, um, and it's the, you know, it's, 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 you're always, I mean, I always think of the budget as you're trying to land like a, you know, like a, at least a, it's like a three sets of, a three dimensional thing at a, at a single point in time. Right, because you have, um, and it's really, it's, it's one thing that has to happen every year, right? There are a lot of other things that don't necessarily have to happen, but the budget always has to happen. And, and being part of the process and being a staff person in the process and in, in, in helping the governor, you know, develop the budget and ensure that there's a budget that reflects his priorities. And he's, as you know, he's, in addition to being an extraordinary leader, he's also like a deep policy wonk. And uh, so the, the first, you know, at some point in September or something, he asked to, if I would help be able to put together his January budget because he wanted to ensure that his January budget, uh, A, was a, you know, a, a, a proposal that really reflected his priorities and also provided in turn the legislature the requisite amount of time for the legislature to consider it, amend it, and ensure that the final budget package reflects the legislature's priorities as well. Um, so he wanted to make sure the Jan 10 budget and, pro, uh, and, and product was, uh, was, was substantive and reflected of what he wanted to do. And kind of being part of, of working with Keeley uh, with the Department of Finance, and it was kind of like our ends in my first big project together. Uh, and working through, you know, I think of like part of what you do as a staff person in that process is like how do you talk about a park, a school, a health clinic, and, you know, Meals on Wheels in comparable with comparable information so that somebody can decide where do they want to go and how do these pieces stack. And it's just, it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a remarkable, in my mind, it's a remarkable process where, you know, always two branches of government, but frequently three, um, are working through what is our joint, you know, spending plan for the next year um, and frequently for years to come. And uh, anyway, it's a... Uh, it's, it's, it was fun. Um, it was fun working on Gen 10. It's been uh, fun working through this process. I don't know. It's some every kind day. Of, some kind of, I, I, uh, it's anyway. I um, it's you know it's it's showing you know showing government working and democracy working and people uh, coming together to work through things that sometimes are really hard, sometimes are easier, sometimes feel kind of impossible. Um, and, and figuring out how to ensure that, the, you know, that you land the plane because this plane constitutionally always has to land. Yeah, that's 
Good. Catherine, talk about the Justice for All agenda and how you bring that lens and, and the use of the tools that you have available to you to advance the priorities. Well, uh, I will start by saying that, that a pleasant surprise for me is that the governor has not needed to be pushed in any point in, in these six months on this. His, his absolute lodestar as governor is, is his belief in a California for all and the, the notion that we should be making sure the government works for all people who are resident here in the state. And that translates from the big policy goals that he announced that he said he, he wanted us to live and to make sure are lived for Californians, but also to the daily hurts and uh, pains that he finds ways to address immediately. Sometimes that's scary for me as a lawyer when he says, I'm going to give a speech in 15 minutes. Is it lawful when I say this? And I think, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I need a little more time. Um, and he says, I'm going. So you know, <laughs> this, this is what we're going to do. Uh, but, but it's also amazing when he finds things that we did not know were going to come, and he finds a way to be a safety net for Californians. So at the beginning of, of his term as governor, the, the uh, federal government lived through the longest shutdown in the United States history, and he was concerned that Californians who are TSA employees were being hurt because they weren't going to be paid. And he said, find a way to make sure that they will be paid and that they will be able to do their jobs, go home to their families, and know that they can pay rent and uh, make, make ends meet. And that was complicated. It was not something that we had planned. It was not on our list already. And uh, it wasn't a guarantee for how to do it. And he just he knew it in his gut. And he, and he knew we had to do it. And that's been amazing to be able to, to live and work in that total justice-oriented focus for him and for every person in the governor's office uh, who works with us. And that's, that's been an amazing pleasure. You know, I'm curious about, because, it, I mean, clearly you're compatible, you enjoy working together, you've got a leader that you have lined up behind and share a vision with, but not everything is wonderful and it's not always perfect and, you what? know, there's big bumps in the road. Yes, I know what. So talk to us about um, one of those difficult moments, one of those times when you were facing a decision that not everybody agreed upon, um, where you really had to wrangle through it and... <laughs> they already know. We can't think of any. Clearly, clearly there's more than one example. <laughs> um, I was just laughing. Oh, I was going to say, you know, what, one of the um, one of the difficult moments is not necessarily in doing the work, but it's in the impact of doing the work and the balance between the price that you know we we get to do this and we stand on the shoulders of lots of other people who pay the price of us doing this. And uh, and not it's not like a um, it, it's not you know it's it's it is always that these are very difficult things and it's really hard to turn it off yeah. and uh, and working through and I think one and I think it's not unlike what lots of other folks live but trying to figure out how to turn it off and be present um, and uh, and and still do the job um, I think that is uh, that is you know at least for me. Uh, a constant challenge, and probably like nothing is more important. Um, and you're talking, Anna, just to be clear, about the personal relationships outside of government exactly. and turning this persona off to be present in yeah. a relationship. Yes, mm -hmm. turning my brain off that is turning on whatever, whatever, yeah. you know, whatever box I'm trying. Like I, I spend a lot of time trying to understand the box that I'm in and figuring out how to get out of it. Uh, and like, so and she's responsible for so flying turning, the plane. Turning, so. like, turning that off and like being present, yeah. um, and you know, and making sure that I'm doing my job, but I'm also like, you know, being like a, you know, at least a halfway decent partner and friend. <laughs> Um, is, uh, is that's one of the things that is, that is really challenging. Thank you for sharing that because I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that many of us in this room have had that same situation and we've talked about you know, being moms and you know, you're also in relationships with others and maybe Anne and Catherine you can talk about those challenges. I think that was a great example. I wasn't actually thinking about decision making in that way but it's a wonderful example of balance. I mean, I think what, just to um, riff a little bit on Anna and also on your, your first question, which is I think everybody brings, 
you make a lot of sacrifices to this job, and they're not just sacrifices you make at the front end. They're sacrifices every single day that you're making, and you're, you're, you're literally making decisions in real time. You're like in a meeting, and it's a really important meeting, and you know you can't end it, but you also know that your daughter is waiting for you and that she's going to be pissed <laughs> <laughs> that you're late. Um, and so it's real, like you're like, okay, I'm here. I'm here in this meeting, and my daughter's waiting, and I'm not sure what to do. Um, so, and so because of the fact that you're dealing with that all the time, it becomes almost like the stakes are even higher when you have a strong opinion about something. So you asked, you know, what is the difficulty? We get along very well, but we also have really strong opinions, and sometimes we don't agree. And so there have been moments where you're like, I just, I fundamentally don't agree with you, and I have a really collaborative leadership style, so I'm never going to be like, and it's my decision. Um, you know, it's really like, okay, how can we get to this decision, um, given how hard it is? And so I think that when there's difficulty, it really is around those two things, which is like, how do you make sure that people feel good about the final decision that has to be made, and it's often me making that decision or the governor making that decision, that you're respecting, you're hearing people, even when there's very strong disagreements. And you know, it's really because people have come to it, they've studied hard, they come to it with the seriousness of their approach, with many, many years of experience, but often different experience. I mean, you know, Catherine and I have not worked in Sacramento before, so we have a really different, you know, experience. And Anna's like, I have seen this, you know, movie before, <laughs> and you should not go down this road. Um, so, you know, I think part of it is like that is just, just really challenging. Um, so, those are the, the things that I'd say. Yeah, I, mean, I will confess, I'm a litigator at heart, so I like the fighting. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm right at home with it, but, but, I, but I do really appreciate that, that we live and work in an office culture that, that is focused on hearing out all ideas from all comers, getting to the solution, and then moving forward, and that there's real respect for that, that healthy disagreement about, uh, about what the policy goal is, and that all of us are working toward the same end goal, which is justice for Californians, and that's, that's such a pleasure. On the, on the question of how we balance uh, personal life and work life, I don't, so <laughs> I just I don't have any good answer on that. I mean, I, I was we were working on, on the death penalty moratorium when it was my daughter's birthday weekend. I had flown home and, and I was trying to manage her birthday party while on the phone with people from uh, California fighting about what we should be doing, letting people in, assuring the parents who were dropping their kids off that yes, there was adult at home, but I was not paying attention at all to what they were doing. <laughs> and you know, everybody survived that party, so that was good. <laughs> Yes. Um, okay. I've got the signal that it's time to take questions from the audience. So I think there's mics coming around. And um, any, any questions from the audience? We've got one over here, Liliana, the Consul General of Mexico. Liliana Ferrer. <laughs> Catherine, were you on the trip with the governor to Mexico when he went down to the border? I was not. Thank you. Uh, Donna Lucas, a great friend of the consulate and a great friend of Mexico, just tells me I need to do it the California way and ask the question in Spanish. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah. We'll see what kind of answer you get. <laughs> well, I comment on a question. I, first and foremost, uh, I'm delighted to be here and, and, and delighted to be with my daughter um, and uh, Maria Cecilia, uh, a college student uh, and soon to be leaving home in about a year, and the mom trying to figure out precisely these struggles, right, of uh, my profession and, and my personal life that I share, I share with you. So I appreciate those comments very much. But uh, my comment is that I feel truly privileged, and I never get tired of saying uh, how honored I am to be serving. I've been a career foreign service officer for over 25 years, been posted all over the US and, and abroad in Europe and Central America but truly privileged to be in a historic moment as Consul General of Mexico in the political capital of this wonderful state. Forever grateful to California because my father was Consul General here 40 years oh, wow. ago. Yes, so I'm a product of the California educational system oh, so nice. and I hope uh, that I uh, uh, am able to stand up to the expectations of the California educational system and every day I say I need to do a wonderful job as a Mexican a diplomat and really contribute obviously, to the relationship with uh, the U.S. In these very challenging times, uh, I would just like to hear a comment uh, from you as to um, the very complex and sensitive uh, situation and position that we are in today. 
Uh, but once again, uh, thank California, thank the governor for the position so, so important, so brave that he has taken uh, on uh, being uh, uh, always uh, with expressions of solidarity towards the just and the correct causes that have to do with humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I might just start by saying, you know, I had this, um, I've had this amazing political experience where I worked on the 2016 campaign, and I was one of the first people, um, because of my long relationship with Hillary, to start that campaign. So I started in September of 2014, so worked on it for more than two years. And, um, you know, it's been a challenging time um, in our country, and oftentimes people will say, you know, how do you, how do you deal with it? And, and there's some things that happen that would happen no matter what, if the, just because there's a different party who won the presidency, and so... You know, it's not a surprise that we have a, you know, a, a Supreme Court candidate like Brett Kavanaugh, who probably would have been a candidate for Supreme Court no matter who was the Republican president. But there are certain things that happen um, that are unprecedented in the history of our country and just unacceptable. And that, you know, one of the things that really struck me before I took this job was the issue of families being separated at the border and what was happening to the children and the fact that our government you know, woefully unprepared, didn't have any plan for reunification of these children, no opportunity to do that. And I was working at a law firm before I took this job after the 2016 um, end of the election, and working with Ben um, at Boy Schiller. And I remember actually the July 4th weekend of, I don't know why I did this on July 4th weekend, so I'm just getting a little into myself, but I actually sat at my kitchen table and I was like, I needed to read everything I could about what was happening with the migrant children at the border, and it has nothing to do with work, it's just I wanted to know. And I wrote an op-ed, and then everyone's like, Anne, you can't publish that. Like, don't do that. So it was just because my feelings were so strong. So I say all that because I, one of the great privileges of working in this job is that now when something happens at the national level, we really are not only serving California and our California are for all, but we are at the front lines of the Trump resistance. And that isn't a, that's not a partisan statement, although it is a partisan statement, but it's also um, a statement of like, we have to stand up for our values and we have to actually be very mindful and serious about what's happening. So when Trump says, tweets out that he's gonna round up everybody and you know, throw them back you know, on the streets or he's gonna bring people to sanctuary cities or gonna bring them back to Mexico, we actually can do something about it. We can file a lawsuit as we often do. We can think about how do we make sure that we're gonna actually be a place of refuge and welcome as we did through the budget by providing funding for the migrant shelter in San Diego. And so, you know, one of the things I would say about living in this moment is being part of an administration that says, this is not acceptable. We're gonna show an alternative and we're gonna be really present and part of that and not have to sit at my kitchen table and just like <laughs> stew about it. <laughs> it's really, really quite lovely. Catherine, did you wanna add anything or um, should we take another question? No, I think that's very fair. Yeah. Any other questions? I wanna ask some, oh, there's a hand up in the back. Um, if we can get a mic back there. Because one of the things that um, I was reflecting on, Anne, while you were answering, is I saw some data that showed um, voter turnout in the last election by millennials by county in the state of California. And it was an increase of 348%. So there is motivation. <laughs> Young people are motivated. And we hear often that you know these social issues are, you know, of essence to them. This is something that really, um, I think, hopefully, 2020, we'll see um, yeah. a real increase in, in voter, re voter registration, voter mobilization. Yes, there's a question in the back. Uh, this is a question regarding uh, women in construction. I'm a mechanical contractor and a business owner. And even when I go on job walks now, I can't tell them I'm the business owner. I should be able to, but I can't. I have to tell them I'm a sales rep or something like that because I won't get the job. I mean, we are so discriminated against still in construction. There's such a labor shortage now that if women got into this field, it would eliminate the labor shortage. So we need somehow to break down those barriers. We need to maybe have more media with women in hard hats and vests up there. I mean, there's so much potential and high paying jobs. And really, we're raising the children. We should be out there in the labor force doing the infrastructure repairs. So Absolutely. if there's some way we could get, you know, just maybe your comments on how do we break down this barrier? Thank you. 
Catherine, you want, you want Anna? I was, oh. I was gonna have Kate take it. She's, <laughs> she's, she's actually she's working on it. Uh, but I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's a critical point, uh, and, um, and, you know, Anne talked about it in, uh, in law enforcement uh, fields. We have, we have a, um, in, and, uh, and, um, had, and, and the governor have directed us to work, Catherine and I, to work with Maribel and others in the context of, you know, making sure that our workforce is reflective of California and that it's reflective of California in all areas. Um, I think uh, apprenticeships is an, op you know, and, uh, and, and looking as we look at the, the investments in, you know, and kind of in, in, in the uh, green uh, technology and how do we ensure that, you know, that we, that, you know, that the jobs in that sector are open to everybody. The governor's uh, proposal in that area that's now part of the budget to ensure that when we are looking at our economy, we have an inclusive economy that is giving people opportunity, uh, ensuring that there's you know greater work in in the uh, you know look, efforts you know the the I think there's been some efforts in kind of firefighters world in terms of trying to get more women into uh, firefighting constructions. I think of uh, one of my former mentors, Cindy Morano, who worked in this area. Um, and trying to ensure in the work of you know, equal rights advocates in the 90s to, um, to make sure that women were going in construction. Because it's not only about what is the composition in the field, but it's also the fact that, the, that many of the places, uh, the construction jobs being a good example, where we see uh, you know, systemic barriers and where we see lower representation of women also tend to be some of the higher paid professions and the relationship between that pay equity, income inequality, and so many of the issues that we can have a better, more constructive economy if we take them on uh, is just critical. So anyway, uh, all to say, uh, um, super, super critical issue and an issue that is, uh, that is at the forefront uh, of our, our minds and the, the work that the governor is asking us to do relative to apprenticeship, relative to an inclusive workforce, and, uh, and relative to California for all. Yeah, I just want to add one thing, which I think is really important. I want to just thank Anna and Catherine, which is that, you know, we come to these jobs, and there's a lot coming at you, and so you have to be really mindful of how you're going to proactively work on issues, and we all have um, spent time in our lives working on pay equity, or, or not pay equity, but equity in general, and income inequality, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is to say, like, let's create space so that we can make sure that we don't just let those go go be the second and third and fourth and fifth and 37th um, issue that we work on, but instead that we take, carve out time. And so like, how do you really make sure that you're doing this? And so I think, you know, the, absolutely um, on apprenticeship and women and making sure that everybody has opportunities for those high paying, good labor union jobs. Um, and that's, you know, critical. And so you've got, you've got a team that's really focused on that and we want to keep doing a good job. So I was told that she shares is um, diligent in ending on time. So we've got less than five minutes. Um, I saw a couple of hands back here. So we're going to take one, one last question. And before you, you ask your question, I'm going to come back to the panel and ask you, given that there's so many young women here, not actually young women, but women who are being mentored. Um, and I don't mean there aren't any. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, young at heart. No, there's women in the audience that are being mentored. And um, what advice you would give to people at that stage of their career when you look back at your um, life trajectory? So we're going to come back and ask for some last words on advice to um, this class of she shares. Yes. Hi, I'm Belen Flores, uh, Executive Director of the California Center for Civic Participation. And um, we work with young people, particularly high school students, to help get them engaged in the political process, local and state. Um, and help raise their voice so that they are there when decisions are being made. Um, so I'd like to know from each of you, what is your vision for young people in this country on how to participate? There are hundreds of ways. Um, young people who are under 18 obviously cannot vote, but there are many things they can do. So very quickly, what is your vision for all these young people? They are um, at, you know, they're at the effect of whatever decisions we're making now, so they are our future. and. Um, I just kind of want to know what your opinions on that are. That's a great last question. So why don't we do this? Combine her question yeah. with the advice for mentorship. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One is I always say to young people who work with me or, or uh, on my team that one of the things I think is really helpful is to pick the thing that you really care about. And it doesn't mean that that's going to be the only thing you work on. But, you know, for me, for example, it's well known that I paid family leave is something I've worked on for many, many years in my life. 
And it's been something that I've deeply studied and know and really have continued to drive. And it, you know, provides me a lot of like focus. And so I think if there's something that you feel really passionate about, um, you know, just kind of grab onto it and do what you can to study it, to know it, to learn it, to go forward. Um, I'll also say I was having a conversation with Anna this morning, we were early morning, walking to a meeting, and we were just have, randomly talking about various things. And one of the things that we were acknowledging is that a lot of what brings you here is luck. I mean, you have to acknowledge, like, you know, of course we got educated, we're smart people, but it, we got some lucky breaks along the way. But it's also a combination of luck and then how you, once you get that lucky break, how do you apply yourself? And I will say that, um, you know, I feel like I have tried really, I always felt like, you know, because I came from a, you know, a family that was not a privileged family, that I always had to prove that I should be at the table. And so I studied really hard and I really wanted to make sure that I said something smart. Um, and I think, you know, a couple of things that happened along my career that were helpful, two pieces of advice that I would give. One is something that Hillary Clinton said to me on the first time I, I actually had the chance to brief her. It was in the late 90s and I was working in the Clinton administration, and she had done these conferences on early childhood, and we were going to do one on adolescence, and I was the person at that point, it was gotten a little more senior in my career, that I was creating the conference, and so I remember going up and sitting in, it was actually in the East Wing, it was in her living room of the White House, and I got a chance, I was super nervous. And so I um, started talking through the agenda, and I was kind of talking quietly, and, and she stopped, she's like, okay, this isn't gonna work for me, <laughs> um, unless you can, speak up and do it confidently. Don't be nervous. Just tell me what, you know, you're smart, you're here. Tell me what you're trying to say and do it with confidence. And it was super generous of her to do that because I think if you can show, I actually know a lot about this and I'm ready to tell you about it and don't be nervous and just show up in the moment. I think that's, you know, extremely helpful. There was one other thing I was going to say, but I'll leave it with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good one. I don't know, I'll go back. Okay. <laughs> well, to, to speak specifically to your question, I, I, I really do think the young people should remember that their voice matters. And even, even if they are not yet able to vote, they are able to influence the voters around them, and they are able to influence their communities. And, and I, I'm, a, I'm a parent of teenagers, and, uh, and my, my eldest teenager was invited to be on the leadership council at her high school, and she was mad at me because she was pretty sure she got invited because of me, which is true. And <laughs> but so she was saying, you know, I can't believe I have to go do this, and you know, I'm just a freshman and I have to go. But she came back from the first meeting and she said, wow, they really listened to my ideas. And it was really fun to be able to share what I think should be happening at school from a perspective that the principal hadn't had. And, and, and I think that is really important for each of us to remember is that we own a perspective. And there's a reason that we have our values, there's a reason that we have our beliefs, and we ought to be sharing them. And that's not unique to adults. That's something that's true for all of us. And so I, I really encourage the young people that you work with to be able to hold that and share their views. And then the advice that I would give to my younger self, the advice that I would give to young people who are coming behind me, is that it does, the optimism is worth it. The, the hope that you have for what your life can be for what your community can be is worth fighting for, and it's worth hoping still, hoping harder, and staying with it, because we don't make linear change necessarily. It's not always as positive as you'd like it to be, but the communities that we build can be really strong. And, and if we commit to them, if we don't walk away from them, we build the places that we want to live in, so it's worth it. Anna. So uh, the first thing that came to my mind when you raised, uh, when you, you, you know, kind of asked your question was Parkland. And just mm. the, uh, mm. just those young people, their, their unbelievable strength and their ability to so quickly turn mm. something that was just so profoundly sad and unfair into, you know, into an opportunity to demand change um, was just, you know, it's just one of those things that I feel like is the, is the kind of thing that, that stays with you and that gives me optimism in today's world. I think that, you know, that there's, I mean, just, you know, I, I look at my friend's kids and the world that they're growing up in is very different than the world that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I try to constantly remind myself, don't, you know, don't, don't like bring in like, you know, my baggage and my sense of rules to limit their perspectives on what can be. Uh, because they, they really, I think, have an opportunity to hold us all accountable and to push us to be you know, to be better. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in terms of the, I'm not like an awesome planner. I'm actually quite a terrible planner. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think the, I've gotten very lucky along the way. And I've basically, when I 
you know, when I, any other prior approach to here's what my career was going to be, it was clear that that was not working. I basically switched <laughs> to doing, basically I do things based on three, three questions. Like, what do I want to learn? Who do I want to learn from? And how does the fact that I care fit into what I do? And so far, it's worked out pretty well for me. So that's my, those are my rules for whatever that's worth. I hope all of you share um, the sense that I have. I mean, these are extraordinary individuals. That was inspiring. It was lovely to hear how candid you were and how committed you are. Um, and I think this state is in great hands. Wouldn't you agree? So <laughs> Catherine, Anna, and Anne, thank you very much for sharing. Thank you.